Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Papp again. Welcome to the ASMR talk show. This is the show that feels good to hear. ASMR, of course, uh, soft sounds, and people hear them, and they get a little tingle in their brain. So we mix that with uh, lively conversation and long format interview. And we got one of those in store for you today. Uh, before that, though, uh, Damien, who works on the show, asked me, uh, oh, so what's new with you? And I, was, I knew I was going to tell this story on the show, so I didn't mention it. But definitely, uh, the biggest thing that's happened to me recently is, uh, you know, OJ tour. Uh, anybody could show up. It's usually going to be a tourist or whatever, but um, got some, some big names on it before. But a couple weeks ago, I'm given the OJ tour, and I spoke for four people just one morning. So I'm like, all right, so I'm standing outside of the McDonald's that, where we meet for the tour. And uh, who should show up? but Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis. Now these are two, I didn't know they were coming. These are like, like literally movie stars. Like this isn't like some guy who's on a TV show or like some like rocker guy who's still hanging around. These are like legitimate celebrities. And I was surprised, uh, obviously, as you would be, but I remembered my improv training and I was like, all right, yes, and let's just do it. Let's go for it. So I was hanging out with these celebrities, these movie stars, for like almost an hour. It was really weird, because celebrities are weird. You know what I mean? And uh, they're just like how you think they would be. It was like being in a movie or something. At the end, I uh, asked to get a, well, first of all, I felt a little weird on the tour. You know, I'm kind of critical of the media and uh, stuff like that. I talk about the OJ case. So I felt a little weird talking about the media and then here are two people who actually appear in tabloids. I didn't want to offend them or anything, but I think they liked it. Uh, at the end, I asked for a picture and I did feel a little weird about that, but I mean like celebrities take pictures with other celebrities all the time, so I figured it was fine. But it was a really good validation to have because the things that celebrities do, their opinions, that makes the news. People care about that. So, uh, you know, I want to tell you whatever Thing you're pursuing out there, whatever creative thing, if you can get the validation of a celebrity, it really means, uh, it really means the world. And uh, you know, I also vow personally, I will never talk ill of those particular celebrities because they were uh, nice to me and went on my tour. And uh, Mila Kunis, by the way, loved the idea of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills tour. So, uh, some big things to come. That's what's going on with me. But uh, the show's not about me, it's about my guest. My guest tonight is the owner, curator uh, of the Hyena Gallery in Burbank. It's a dark art gallery. What is dark art? Well, let's find out right now from Bill Schaefer. Bill, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, man. So, uh, that's when I was reading the descriptions of the gallery, I have been in there and stuff. It's a dark art. And, and it's a you know, catch-all term, I guess, but yeah. do you like that term? Is that how you describe what your gallery does and specializes in? Yeah, I do like the term. Uh, I, I think it separates it from pop art, uh, even though a lot of pop art can be dark, dark yeah. art. But it kind of tells people ahead of time you're getting to some heavier territory than the typical gallery. And what? so what falls under this dark art? Yeah, serial killer art. Oh, yeah, it's... it's you got... It. Everything. <laughs> like Monsters. A fine art, a lot of horror movie, um, tribute art, um, just art from artists' imaginations. I mean, the earliest art, like religious art, was really dark, like Albert Durer. Like, you can't look at some of his pieces without feeling this cold chill. And it horrified people back when they came out. So, I mean, dark art and the concept of it has always been around, like Hieronymus Bosch and things like that. So, it's, it's kind of everything. But the gallery, and this swings the gamut from, it's just what I like. So it goes from like Monty Python to serial killers to horror movies to so, whatever. So there's no real through line to this other than what you are personally interested in. Yeah, yeah. So then is there anything that you like but like doesn't fit the brand of hyena so you can't like include that? <laughs> no. Guilty pleasure, nothing? <laughs> no, no, all my stupid obsessions, you'll find them in there. Like I love vanilla ice. So you'll find Vanilla Ice stuff, you'll find like Honey Boo Boo stuff. Why do you like, like Vanilla Ice? Oh, it, oh, it's one of those things I made fun of until I liked it. You know, that happens. 
So there's a little like, irony involved in, in this a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm always trying to tell people you can like more than one thing. Like, it's a dark art gallery, but if you go in there and explore, you're going to find something really interesting to you that other people might not dig, but you're going to find this some, kind of something for everyone. That's what I like about the store, because it really has a lot, of, a lot of random stuff in there. Yeah. I got some OJ books in there, I think, once, uh, some VHS tapes. I've noticed the stuff, is this just come out of your personal collection? Oh, no, the I'm stuff always, in the store, or always you, finding stuff. You have sources. Yeah, I'm always looking around, finding collections, and I have other people that find stuff and bring it in to me, but they know what I like. So, so you're just tapped into the yeah. world. and I really love archaic media. So we get the VHS mm -hmm. and Laserdiscs and books. Like, I've been really focused on books there lately. Our books are archaic? Yeah. I, nobody reads anymore. <laughs> well, people <laughs> read like, all the time. I do, but I, I, like, I like having that kind of stuff. So it encourages people to see it and be like, oh, I can read. I can kind of explore this stuff. And the topics go all over the place. And you will do themed shows yeah. at the gallery. And you had one about Charlie Sheen. Oh yeah, that was that was the so pop culture is a big one. part of this. Oh yeah, it, 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 that could be maybe one of the themes in it. Well, pop culture helps kind of get people's attention. It's, it's stuff everybody likes or everybody's aware of, so that kind of can bring people into the gallery, and then they'll find the more esoteric stuff and the, the weirder stuff. You know, it's kind of like a gateway drug. <laughs> But you had a show about Charlie Sheen when he was uh, going on tour and he was yeah. the winning and stuff, and he showed up yeah. to the gallery? Yeah, yeah. That was, that was our five-year anniversary, and I had this kind of heavy show planned for it, and like two weeks before the show, I realized, I don't want to do a heavy show for our anniversary. I just want to do something stupid and fun. And I'd been making fun of, not making fun of, I'd been laughing about the whole Charlie Sheen, Sheen situation. So it was cracking me up. I thought it was brilliant. And I, I called a bunch of artists and said, hey, we're doing a Sheen show. And that's what happened. And we put it together in two weeks, and it was brilliant. I sent out some feelers. So I kind of thought, you know, I'm, I'm like two people away from everyone. Like, we all are. Like, if you just know that one person who knows that person, you can get to someone. So I sent out a bunch of feelers, and the next day we got a call from Charlie Sheen. Him himself? <laughs> Him himself. People. Yeah. He called the Him. store? Yeah, yeah. It was brilliant. It's so funny. And Did you think somebody was putting you on? No, no, it was obviously you him. You knew it was. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, hey, uh, this is Charlie Sheen. It was it like you think it no, would it's be? it's like, hola, hi in a gallery. This is the warlock, Charlie Sheen. Your gallery is radical. <laughs> it was a blast. And then he made an appointment, came in and saw the show. And he filmed like a 20-minute piece where he talked to each piece of art. And it, it's, the, it's so funny. Like, he's hyper-intelligent. And he was such a good dude to us. And then when he went on tour, I, I ended up talking to him a lot during that. He would call in and check in and stuff. Did but, you get the impression that it was uh, like a, a spectacular public meltdown, or it was kind of put on because he's a professional entertainer, yeah. or a little of both? Or well, in, in the press release I sent out, I, I basically explained I think he's a genius. Like he, he's having fun with the situation. He's a really good actor, and he's using that to create a character that he's attacking Hollywood and the Hollywood system with. And he related to that, and like, we talked about that a lot, actually. And he was really happy. He's like, you, you fucking get it, man. You're the one. Like, you, you understand. And, and the conversations I had with him, like behind the scenes, it was just totally normal. Like, totally normal, dude. And you still keep in touch with him? No, no. Because he's kind of gone, I, gone I, straight again. I, I talked bit. to him often until it was announced he didn't get back on the Two and a Half Men show. And then he went into like other mode and had to figure out his new show. Yeah, because he's on a show that just went straight to syndication. Yeah, the anger management. Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, it's good work if you can get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. What other, what other shows have you put on? You did something with Troma? Oh, we did, we did a great show with Troma and Lloyd Kaufman. Like Lloyd was an inspiration to me since I was a kid, so it was like a huge honor to work with him. Uh, we've done shows with Wes Craven. Uh, Wes Wes actually had a bunch of art in Scream Four, and we did a Scream Four show with that art, and then a, a Wes Craven tribute show after that. Um, John Carpenter, we did a tribute show to him with John there. Uh, Guillermo del Toro, 
Toby Hooper, uh, Stuart Gordon, a lot of horror directors. So how'd you get established mm -hmm. in this world? You just, you had good taste and you were identified as the guy <laughs> who could make it happen? Yeah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like I had been collecting art since I was in my teens. And like comic book art and serial killer art is what I started with. And then I found fine art and was really drawn to that. And when I moved out here, I just wanted to open an art gallery and sell stuff I loved. And I guess people kind of realize there's a genuineness there and it's not me trying to sell you like Hootie and the Blowfish albums, you know, I'm trying to pull one over. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly selling stuff I really care about. What'd you do before you were art gallery curator? Oh, I had a, a small chain of stores in Boston, music stores. Okay. And yeah, because there is that music seems sort of related to this field. Uh, yeah. Dark art, oh, yeah. is, that's part of it, but also the pop art too. Is, I don't know, but the music is kind of a... a yeah, it's, a it's, it's essential it, yeah. To, yeah. to me at least in my artistic wanderings because like, some of the first fine art I saw was on heavy vinyl album covers. So you know, picking up like Rainbow or like, you know, these great Frizzetta and Ken Kelly designs. And, um, you know, the Kiss Destroyer album is beautiful. It's a great painting. Yeah. So that's kind of a, another gateway I got into this with. So they want us to be a little quieter. Yeah. Well, then you can maybe are the the only person who can answer this question then, because you know about the weird Hollywood legends. You know about music, and you know about uh, all these you have extensive knowledge on stuff. Michael Jackson. Do you think he molested those kids? Oh, that's such a weird question. Because this is, back in the 90s, everyone said, oh yeah, totally. But as time has gone on, that's kind of been written out of his legacy. And people will back away from the question when you ask them. They don't want to be pinned down to it these days. Okay, I, I don't think he did it. I don't think he did anything overly inappropriate. I think he made poor choices and did stupid things. But I don't think he molested kids. And, and it's weird, I, I am, I'm closer to that than you think. I really wanted to be touched by him. And I, no, <laughs> I tried and just wouldn't. But, but uh, my wife is a florist and she worked for the Mar Marlon Brando's family. And Miko Brando was Michael Jackson's like best friend, right hand man. We had spent a lot of time with them. And I asked him so many questions about it. And my, my whole impression was he was just a weirdo. Like, but not but if anybody... a malicious weirdo. If anybody is going to be a child molester, wouldn't you think it would be the weirdo who wants to sleep in bed with kids? No, because it seems too obvious. It's sometimes most obvious. You know, he didn't have sweet tea. That's how you, right? Isn't that what they do? Like, like, oh, and <laughs> to catch a predator. <laughs> yeah. You could have sweet tea. No, that's how that, the, the, the bait gets the molesters. Yeah, is the yeah. kids should have offered him the sweet tea. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Okay. Shit. But no, I, I just think he was weird and, and made dumb choices. And it was it was that that shady dentist, the kid's yeah. father. Did you know about the whole thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. He, the guy who accused Michael Jackson was like a dentist to the stars, mm -hmm. who wrote f phony prescriptions and stuff. Yeah. And then he committed suicide like four months yeah. after Michael Jackson died. Yeah. It's crazy. I just think he was in a position where no one told him no. Like, oh, this is stupid, I don't do that, it's a horrible idea. You know, because everyone was kind of riding his paycheck. So if you tell them no, you might be out of the loop and then you don't get the benefits. You know, okay. I think that has a lot to do with it. Well, you you speak with authority, all right. Uh, for I, I really, I honestly, <laughs> I don't know. It's my opinion, mostly. Yeah. But, well, no, but that's it, uh, because but once you get enough people's opinions together, that just becomes the fact, you know what I mean, or a widely held opinion. You, you yeah. can't really argue with it, whether it's true or not. You and, know? Like, and Corey Feldman he hasn't listed him. He's like on the big pedo crusade, like calling out Hollywood, yeah. and he's never said Michael, he stated Michael did nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? I guess he, got, he was framed. Yeah. But that's kind of the thing you cover, though, on your, I love your Instagram account. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Because it'll just be about, like, whatever your, I guess, into that week. Yeah. Do we kind of do themes, I noticed? Yeah, it's, it's whatever I'm reading about. Like, I try to learn something every morning or, or relearn something often. Just spend my morning productively, like give an hour, two hours just learning about something. And I figure, well, I'll just share that with folks. And I get on tangents. Like, I just did a whole week on presidential assassinations. Okay, so I wanted to talk 
loop back, oh, we'll come loop back around to that. Uh -huh. But do you write the posts yourself? Uh, some I do, some I just edit from, through sources. Like I'll take like three or four sources where the best info is, and I'll just edit in a more read readable form. Uh, when I first started doing it, I used to I used to actually write all the pieces myself, and uh, it took a lot of time and people. Nobody really cared. <laughs> it's sad to say, but I, when I started just editing, I got the same exact response, and it was a little easier on me. Um, but I, I do like writing them. When I, when I have time, I do it. Like I wrote like a 14-part a JonBenet Ramsey one that I wrote most of that from compiling different information. And okay, so that one, who, who did it? Oh, Santa. It was the Santa? I think it was Santa. Just a, a creep in the neighborhood yeah. who knew the layout of the house. He, he had a harp. They carved the names of dead children in, like on it. Um, his wife had written a play about a girl who was, you know, a kid who was kidnapped and then murdered, exactly like John Bonet was. Before, or after. Before, long before, and like her son went to prison for kidnapping and like this weird, shady family. And there must have been something with the police too, where they just weren't investigated right. I, I think there were multiple people in on it. Um, does conspiracy? Oh yeah, I love I love the thought of that conspiracy, but that's the only thing that makes sense where someone hasn't been caught. That must be a conspiracy. Down. Yeah, yeah. What are some mm. provable then conspiracies? What's something that a lot of people thought was a conspiracy and then it came out like, oh yeah, it really was. <laughs> oh no, that's that's tough. Well, the CIA controlling the media. Okay, that the CIA stuff. Like Operation Bluebird was that? Like. It was kind of rumored, and then it, when it finally was revealed, like, oh yeah, they actually did infiltrate the music, the music, the uh, film industry, everything, papers, kind of created our counterculture for us. The hippie <laughs> movement, that was all created, you know, to find communists. Well, to, to dangerous young people, to discredit the protest movements that were building up in like San Francisco and everything. A lot of that just started on Laurel Canyon with like Frank Zappa's whole crew of freaks, and his his dad was like a MK Ultra guy from Baltimore in the military. It's really strange stuff, and it's like there's so many coincidences. Wait, you think Frank Zappa was working for the man? I'm saying his father was. Because uh, I would buy that. Zappa's too uh, he's so, too tight. He's so too straight Republican straight laced, yeah. yeah. But he really could play the guitar. Yeah. I explain that. You can have talent and you know work for the man too, right? Theoretically. <laughs> but all the, all those cats, those musicians that were from the Laurel Canyon scene, Jim Morrison's dad was an, a Navy admiral. Um, he went to sc military school with Janis Joplin. Her dad was military. It's all crazy. But wouldn't the then? See, this is where I gotta argue with you. If the military was behind it, why is this the music any good? Why it seems like they wouldn't be competent enough. Have you heard Crosby, Stills and Nash? It's not good. <laughs> so, they, so they're in the Navy too. Oh, uh, what's it? David Crosby? He's another one of those cats. He comes from banking money. Like he's like a rich, rich motherfucker. And like, I don't know. It's it's if you're digging into conspiracies, you can go down every rabbit hole. So I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying I, I like to think it's true because it makes sense to me. But who knows? And it makes it a little more fun, too. Yeah, it makes it so much more fun. If you know the answer, that's over. Yeah. The presidential assassins, you, you pointed this out in one of your posts, people always think it's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Do you think it always is a conspiracy? No, sometimes it's just a loon. It's a crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so weird, like, because, like, um, the, the Sarhan Sarhan one I was reading, and then at his parole hearing, the guy who was like wrestled him to the ground yeah. was like, "Oh no, he was under my control." Yeah, yeah. What makes people flip the script all those years later? Uh, Martin Luther King's children thinks James Earl Ray yeah. was framed. I, I have a portrait of Martin Luther King, done by James Earl Ray in the gallery. People flip out when they see it, but I'm like, well, his family actually thinks it's a nice tribute. Like, they, they never believed he did it. And I, Why, though? What's in it for them to not believe it? I, I think it's such a distrust of the government which makes it easier to believe it. Like, well, of course, of course they're behind that. Look at JFK and Bobby and Bobby Kennedy. Like, of course they did this. 
even the, the Carter one I just did, uh, the, the Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter attempted assassination. Like, it was a botched assassination at a pivotal point in his career as president when he was about to start doing some really heavy stuff for, for the people. And everyone associated with it was, uh, had a name that kind of mimicked the JFK assassination. You had an, a Lee Harvey, you had an Oswald, like you had all this stuff going on there. And, it, and people said that was the CIA going, we can do this at any time, you play ball now. And that's, they say that's why he was such an ineffectual president and became such a huge humanitarian afterwards. So, I mean, it's easy to believe the government's scum. It is, but then the fact that they could competently yeah. execute these conspiracies, I don't... Yeah, that, that, that is tough to believe. Yeah, right? <laughs> that this, these, like, contractors, these people yeah. they hire can just do this. And all these uh, manpower, yeah. all these people are able to keep it. They try to get a yeah. permit, like, in the city of Burbank, and it takes, yeah. like, eight months and 40 people. Yeah. So. But then they could secretly... Okay, what about uh, Paul is Dead? Do you like that one? Uh, I don't Bill, really care Bill about the Beatles. You don't care about the no, Beatles? No, There's so much good it, pop it, culture stuff in there. It took Charles Manson to make them interesting for me. You know, like, people are like, oh, the White Album's coming out. I'm like, well, is it going to inspire any new murders? Because that could be interesting, but otherwise I don't care. But they have so much fun <laughs> uh, folklore about them. Yeah, the folklore is interesting, but I just I never liked them, so it's not yeah, really on my radar like too much. Oh, okay. okay. Well, here's one. I don't know if you've done a, um, a piece about this one, but uh, Thomas Kincaid, the artist, the painter of light, do you know about him? Oh, yeah. What do you yeah. think of that? Thomas Kincaid is, for those of you who don't know, um, it's like mall art. It was mass produced. Well, like mass produced Christian mall art. Like, was it Christian too? Oh, yeah, painter of light. Oh, that's what that means. Yeah, the candle stood for God, like in every oh. in every window. Like, and there'd be these like McMansions. Yeah, and in the snowy people, scene. Yeah. But he OD'd on cocaine or something like that. Oh, yeah, he was a womanizer, drug abuser. Uh, pissed on a statue of Mickey Mouse at Walt Disney, like <laughs> always getting pulled in for drunk driving. Like he was, you know, the kind of person you would expect that would paint that stuff. So does that make his art more interesting? Do you think? Uh, not that art. I know he has like volumes of dirty art he did, like the, probably the art he really wanted to do. Um, I talked with uh, Ron Edwards at Last Gasp when I saw him in San Fran once and. He was telling, they put out a book on Kincaid, and it was really uh, normal, all the normal stuff. And they, he thought people would think it was kitsch, but nobody really dug it. But he was telling me about the dirty art he wants to put out, that the, the foundation won't let him touch because it ruins the image. So it's still a booming business. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah it's up in Solvang. They still have uh, the Thomas Kincaid Gallery. He has yeah. Disney prints yeah. where it's like the town from Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. But it's like all in that style. Oh, and there was a huge scandal, too, with the, the Thomas Kincaid stores, where they, they bought into this, like, pyramid scheme, and all everyone who bought into it got ripped off really bad and lost a lot of money, and there was lawsuits back and forth. So would you ever do a Thomas Kincaid show at Hyena? Oh, we, we've actually joked about it. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll be... Uh, I'll probably, probably, like, altered Kincaids or something like that, but... It's, they're not cheap. No, no. To get that, <laughs> which is just a poster. I don't, yeah. whatever. Uh, so as you're going through the dark art and, and, and curating and stuff, do you see trends coming through artists? You've been at it about ten years, you know. Are there any trends? Do you see a lot of stuff getting repeated. A lot. Do you ever kind of get? I'm gonna say tired of it because it's just your bag, you know. But like, what you always see is someone who makes it famous doing a style, and then you'll get the copycats to come after. Like the big eyed trend was huge. When Mark Ryden took that from the Keens and got hugely successful, then everybody wanted to be the next Ryden, so they are painting big eyed stuff. And trends work because the public falls for them. That's why we have Funko Pops. Like it's the same type of easy to relate to thing. Oh, that's popular, I like this. And I always want people to ask for more, like look for more than just that. Find the real depth in things. So, like, again, the trends come and go, but 
when, when I see purely original vision, that's what gets me excited. I'm right there with you. Yeah. If somebody wanted to develop their eye to look for this weird kind of stuff, how would you recommend they do that? Go to museums. Like, visit like the Hammer Museum, LACMA, go and see art that we've already determined is classic. And because it's, it's important for a reason. And you'll, you'll stand in front of a Moreau at, at the Hammer Museum and you'll just be in awe. And then when you look at the, the Funko Pop big-eyed painting that someone's doing, you'll, you'll get like, oh, okay, that's what this is. This is, this is kind of pop drivel, which is fine. There's always a place for that. But there's, there's substance here. And you just kind of find out what you like, too. And it's okay to like dumb shit. Like, <laughs> Well, if you want some dumb shit, or some great shit, <laughs> stop by the Hyena Gallery in Burbank. Really the perfect town, by the way, for oh, yeah. something like this. Burbank is so weird. Burbank's very bizarre. It's just the runoff of the entertainment business. Yeah. Great place. What shows do you have coming up? Uh, well, our next show in October is a tribute show to Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. <laughs> And just the third? Just the third one. That's <sighs> the most important one. And then we'll have some of the cast and crew there. And then uh, Thea Sachs' show, solo show in November, which is going to blow people's minds. She has a kind of like a Joe Coleman style. So it's, it's kind of like my Destroy the Days. Yeah. Each piece is like an encyclopedia entry in art form. And, and then December, we're finishing up the year with a, a show about Aleister Crowley. Nice. You're always doing great stuff. So we appreciate it. Thank you for coming by the show. Check out the Instagram if you're not in Burbank. Hyena Gallery Instagram. Uh, and you can mm. uh, do the ASMR talk show Instagram too if you wanted to follow us. But anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next time. This is Adam Papp again reminding you that there's a place you can go and it's your mind. Good night.